Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and I am joined here with a new friend that doesn't feel new, Angie, who is also from the South. She's just like a couple hours down the road from me in Athens, Georgia. And I'm going to say, Angie, you won for the Athens, uh, for the town um, tarot that we were going to do with Stephanie. But I started watching your channel. I've been talking to you off screen. I was like, I have to get this girl on because we need more Southern women voices in this movement that we're in. And Angie, like we were talking off screen. And I was like, I got to hit the record button because these stories are just too great. But before, before we go any further, though, I want to go ahead and show you guys Angie's channel so that when we're done, you guys can go and hit subscribe because Southern women, I've said it before, we're the most savage human beings in the whole world but we do it with a smile on our face and our lipstick on. So if you guys want a great channel to watch with Angie, go and subscribe, subscribe to her channel. Um, we'll get more into what you're putting on your channel in a little bit, but welcome to the show, Angie. Thank you so much. I've been so excited. I've been very nervous. You know, it's funny how we, we think that we're not worthy you know, a lot of us like will think, oh, I can't believe Bryce, you know, has invited me to do this because um, like, why is she even interested in me or finds anything that I have to say interesting? And then I'm thinking, like I was telling you earlier, like talking to my best friend yesterday and she was like, stop it, stop it. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's that. And I, I know what you're saying. That's that like, you know, we're so conditioned in the matrix to think like, there's this group of people and that group of people, but I'm just a normal person and I wouldn't even have a platform if it wasn't for David Zublick. And so yeah. I kind of learned that right away with the YouTube game that in our corner of the, of the internet, um, I think it's important that we showcase each other, especially since I do have a bigger platform. I can, I can showcase other people's work because it is hard to catch those algorithms. It is hard to get your story out sometimes unless you can catch it with another channel that can help you. And that's what we're, that's my whole thing. We're all just walking each other home. You know, we're all here to help each other. And, um, and your voice is important. Everybody's voice is important. Your voice is very important. I was watching one of your videos the other day about um, religion and spirituality where you talked about how like, and we we're laughing. I was laughing about that with Angie because, you know, down here in the South, um, the church is such a staple part of our culture. And it's not even for a lot of cases, it's not even about the religion. It's a social center as well. And um, I, I'll I told, I've told this story before, but before we get into it, I told Angie, I'd tell this story on, um, on the show. So my mom's family, uh, the, the Bryce's, my mom, my name is my mom's maiden name. Uh, they moved to Georgia from Charleston, South Carolina. The Bryce's are all from, my grandfather was a surgeon and they got moved to Atlanta. And back in the day, whenever you, they may still do this in small towns. I don't know. Whenever you moved the church, church ladies from different churches would come to your house, bring you casseroles, introduce you to the neighborhood, invite you to the church. Well, my grandmother at the time had just moved to Atlanta. She had four children, four girls. The youngest was a baby. And my mom said they were playing in their house. And all of a sudden my grandmother yells, girls go hide under the bed. The church ladies are coming. <laughs> so they all got under the bed with my grandmother to hide from the church ladies knocking on the front door. And so my mom said for years, she was terrified of the church ladies. She didn't know who the church ladies were. She just knew she had to hide from them. And I just find that hysterical because that's so Southern culture. And so let's start there, Angie. Let's talk about that video because you were talking about an astrology book you've gotten and what your relationship is like now with the divine since you've come into this great awakening, especially kind of moving out of that cultural conditioning into more of a more authentic place of understanding God or the cosmos or... Right. Well, it all just, it all just really makes sense. It's not anything that I'm trying to even figure out anymore. I mean, there are, I don't know everything, but everything that I do learn that I do discover immediately clicks. It's not like, oh, I don't know what these words in this King James version mean. And I, I don't, I'm, I just don't understand the Bible. I'm supposed to understand it, but I don't, you know, it's not like that. It's just like everything just makes perfect sense. Yes, it does. It resonates. Um, but going back to the whole thing about the church ladies, that just brought back a memory of, I grew up in um, Albany, Georgia, and I had country grandparents and then a city grand. Oh, so I had like both. And my country grandparents, I stayed with most weekends and they lived out in Sylvester, like out in the country. They had a farm, they had cows, they had people came and um, paid to pick 
beans and by the bushel and they also had fish ponds where people paid to fish and, you know that kind of thing so I grew up like weighing fish shelling peas and all this but I can remember so many times my grandmother Gertrude <laughs> grandma Gert she'd say Angie they're coming down the driveway she had this long driveway it was straight and you could see like when the church people were coming whether it be even even her friends that just went to church with her that were coming over to play cards, which she also had to put the cards away. She couldn't have her. They played setback and pinochle and canasta, and she had to hide the cards if the church people were coming, except for certain church people that were her friends that played cards with her. So, you know, like, <laughs> I think I was always there. So I just remember all these things. But um, she I remember one day she's saying, run back to the closet and put on your cool locks. She had made me these ugly polyester, elastic waist, long, you know what culottes are? Yeah. That's what she called them. It's yeah. Like, it's, they were baggy. Like, <laughs> well, and I, that, that when you said that, that reminded me of my, cause even in my, I think my childhood, so I'm 39. I think I was like the last generation to experience like a true Southern like childhood. Mm -hmm. We had to wear saddle locks for shoes with lacy socks. Yeah. Um, we had our. Which I love now. Like, I think it's I know, I, well, my, I see my nieces and my nephew now, and they're in, like, play clothes all the time. Like, we had to wear, like, our hair was always, like, pulled back in a bow. You know, it was always very um, prim and proper. Grow, like, the stuff that, and so I could under, when you said that your grandmother would yell at that, I could hear my parents yelling, like, go, you know, I'll tell you. Okay, so, you, and you know the Piggly Wiggly, right? The Piggly Wiggly. Oh, yeah. Wiggly. We, I didn't, that, we it didn't eat there, but, yeah, shot yeah, there all the time. So, <laughs> I was, um, this is when I was in college and I had come home to visit, uh, for, I don't I can't remember if it was summer, some, some, some holiday. And I was, I was a runner at that time. And I'd gone out to run a trail early in the morning. Cause we know in Georgia, when it's that hot, you got to go early in the morning. So my way back home, I stopped by the Piggly Wiggly to grab a bottle of water. And I walked into my mom's house in my sweaty running clothes with a bag from the Piggly Wiggly with water in it. And my mother <laughs> freaked out she was like i hope no one saw you you can't you did you really go into the piggly wiggly with those sweaty clothes on i hope no one saw you i was like well first of all it's like seven o'clock in the morning i'm like mom it's just the piggly wiggly but that's that southern like you know gotta have your mascara and your lipstick i'll, I'll tell you yeah, another yeah. i don't know if my mom will probably kill me for saying this but one time um she was having a very serious conversation with me and she sat me down and she said you know with my sister girls if i'm ever in a coma and I thought she was going to say, you know how much I love you, or this is where, yeah. you know, the money's buried. I don't know. She goes, just make sure you got my roots and my face done. Well, you saw I just did my roots for you. <laughs> I, yes. That's it. Just make sure you get my roots done and my face done. <laughs> I was like, okay, mom. <laughs> so that's very, that's, that's still magnolias. And I tell people all the time, that's one of the, the most beautiful things about growing up in the South too, is I like watch still magnolias. That's like how you grow up. You yeah. know, that's how that's that, yeah. that. And I say all the time, Southern women, you know, I think Southern women do r rule the roof in most houses. They are the um, kind of the head of the house, even though in a lot of homes, it's the man that's making the money. The wife kind of runs everything. I think my husband used to say, and we've, we've been married 25 years now. <laughs> so when, I remember in the beginning, he would say things like, I rule the roost, but you rule the rooster. <laughs> like, you know, you know where he's going. <laughs> <laughs> I, my friend Catherine Edwards sent me a meme once of this Southern girl looking out. It was like when Southern women um, ask you if you had, do you know Jesus? They're, I can't remember what it said. They're not asking for politeness. They're asking you because you're about to go meet him. You yeah. know, like that. You don't, you don't, yeah. post that Southern mother can give you that look. Well, right at the end, right before he died, he accepted. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Always Southern, the stories. I, it is like, and my grandparents too, my grand, my mom's mom was from Charleston, South Carolina. So she had that like South Carolina accent. I just remember her saying sugar, sugar. I never saw her in pants. She always wore dresses and high heels. I can remember when we started kind of wearing pants. I have an aunt growing up that her husband was a deacon in the church, you know, the Baptist church and the, and she, oh, I remember when they got divorced and she started wearing pants, you know, it was just <laughs> so scandalous, so scandalous. 
I get my, my mom's mom, my dad's mom wore pants, but my mom's mom, she always had a beautiful dress on. She always had her jewelry on. She always had her high heels on and she was a housewife, yeah. but she would have girls, women come over and play bridge. They would play, play bridge together. Um, and you're right. That's what's so funny to me. Like I laugh about the tarot cards. I'm like, how many Southern women have a deck of tarot cards hidden in their house from their husbands? Lovely. Like how my daughter have- and I have a daughter in Brooklyn, New York. Can you believe? I mean, yeah. And so she just told me the other day that she, a friend of hers gave her a deck and she's trying to learn. So I don't have one. I really don't. But I find that find them fascinating and fun. My, my dad's mom, I've told this story before. She was kind of the, she was from Quitman, Georgia. You might know where Quitman is. I know where Quitman is. is. Yep. Yeah. That's where she grew up. Diddle. Yep. Yes. Right by Valdosta is the big city, but she grew up I on used a to do a festival there called the Skillet Festival. Oh, really? I haven't been to Quitman in such a long time. My great grandfather died when I was four. So it was the last time I went to Quitman. But I do remember the house and I do remember the property because there's this huge property, this old like plantation house. In fact, I know this is probably going to be, I mean, well, people watching us are awake, but my grandmother had a painting of her house. She grew up in that's very big in the South too, to have paintings of your house. And she would tell everybody the house. Behind was me. <laughs> yes. That's so normal. Right. My, that's so normal. My grandmother would tell people they come in. She'd be like, now this house is so old. It was bu- built by slave labor. Like she would, that would be the first thing she told people about the house that she grew up in the painting of the house. But yeah, my grandmother from Quitman, Georgia, she, um, she was very um, much into the metaphysical and she went to church every Sunday. She even played the organ at church at one point, but she had her books on reincarnation that she hid under the bed for my grandfather. She loved meditation. She always wanted to know what I was learning in India. So there is, and I think too, and you know, Angie, we were talking about before we you bought a book on the ghost of Athens, but I've said this before in the deep South here, this land breathes. Yes, it does. I want to know what's happening here. here on the land I built this house on because, because this is an, a newer home we built. But there's just things happening. <laughs> like, what, what does this land hold? Like, what, what um, history does it really hold? Yes, it's, it's uh, my, my good friend Cindy, who is family's from Peru. We were talking about it um, off in, in Atlanta. We were, she's my friend offline. And and she was saying, too, that the South is the most magical place in the world. There's just something mystical about the land down here. And she goes down to the Okefenokee Swamp a lot to do stuff. And we know down in New Orleans, the bayou, like there's just this element of nature. And I don't know, have you heard of, since you're from that area of Georgia, have you heard of the Georgia werewolf? No. I've covered it on my channel before, but actually it hit me. Maybe we should do another deep dive into the Georgia werewolf because it's near that area of the legend of the Georgia werewolf of the shapeshifter. So, and since you're from that area, that might be, I think if I had seen that video, maybe a year ago, I wouldn't have believed it. And then now I'm like, Oh, yes. (laughs) I covered that story a long time ago on my channel. And I actually, I was something told me like we, Angie and I need to go back and look at that story because you're from that, that, that vicinity. Mm -hmm. So you know more about that land and about what, what's going on in that area of, and Georgia's for those who aren't from Georgia, Georgia's an interesting state because North Georgia, technically kind of where Angie and I are, it's at the base of Appalachia. And so it's very green. It's a lot of um, hills and low, low, low mountains, but then you get South and you're getting close to Florida. So it becomes like plains. It becomes yeah. very low land. Um, and so the different areas of Georgia are going to give you different feelings just from the environment. But, right. um, but where we, Angie and I are, cause Athens is what, like an hour and an hour and a half outside of Atlanta. Yeah. Not if that. that. Mm-hmm. If that yeah. maybe an hour, 10 minutes. Yeah. It's easy. We go there. Our friend, well, the guy who does my opening song for, for, um, uh, esoteric Atlanta, Josh McKay, he lives in Athens. I was telling you he's there um a lot of music in Athens Athens is a cool town it is I mean it's, it's been a really fun place you know so I wasn't originally from here I've been here since 91 but so I guess I am you know I've been here a long time but um yeah I mean shows all the time I mean and the opportunities that have come our way you know um just like you know, um, Alabama Shakes band yeah. you know, years ago came through and the drummer had our pickles, you know, and well, I want you to talk about your pickles too in a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he went crazy over them. And so he's like, Oh, you know, emails me. He's got to have more. He needs them on the tour bus and, um, wanted to invite me to 
the hangout festival and, you know, and I looked it up online. I was like, I'm not going to that thing, like shoulder to shoulder with all these sweaty people. But then we weren't anywhere near those people. <laughs> that is up. I'm like, oh, we're in a cold tub, like bubbling cold tub, looking over the fence. Still, looking you know? at the sweaty people. <laughs> so anyway, things like that. Like I do know we've been very, very blessed just by, you know, honestly, just blooming where I'm planted. Yeah. Not being afraid because... I mean, I've the adversity, like when I first started Fickles, um, of I had just joined Facebook and that was scary. You know, like I wasn't supposed to. My husband's like, I don't think you should do that, you know, whatever. He went on a hunting trip to that place, that house back there. And so and um, it's in South Carolina. And he uh and while he was gone, I had that big, you know, monster of a of a computer and I logged on and there was an invite to Facebook from a, an older lady friend. And I thought, well, if she's on it, then it, it can't be scary. So I, I joined and my very, very first post was I'm pickling beans today. <laughs> and I didn't even have a company or anything. Just like, that's what I'm doing. Well, that's so let's say so where Angie lives, just so you guys understand her connections the university oh, sorry, at Athens is where the University of Georgia is located. And the University of Georgia is like one of the has turned into one of the most prestigious universities in the United States. It's um, both of my both of my parents went to Georgia, my dad went to veterinarian school, uh, veterinary school in Georgia, which is now I've learned the best veterinary school in the world is in, at, in, at the University of Georgia in Athens. Um, it's also where bands like REM is from. Um, and uh, B-52s are from Athens. There's a lot more bands from Athens. There's a lot of um, cultural stuff that goes through Athens, Georgia. And it definitely is very much a college town in the sense that you can feel the influence of, of the university around you when you're there. But there's so much else um, that's happening in Athens that's very it's very eclectic. And there's also that old Southern too. I mean, you were telling me your husband's family is like generational. So you have that, that's when you're driving through Athens, you're driving through all the old uh, neighborhoods with like the old right. beautiful antebellum homes. Um, and the houses were named like the Finnessy house and the Finnessy Hamilton house and the Finnessy Seagrest house. I mean, they're all over town. Yes. Yes. So uh, do you want to give anybody a bit of the background of your family since we're going to be covering Athens in a future episode? So your husband's family is like a big deal in Athens. A big deal, you know, yeah. and, um, and I am from like nothing. We always said like I, I married like the silver spoon, even though that doesn't mean that you're not you can't lose it all, <laughs> which we did, you know, but um, so it it just a completely different thing. I me coming from South Georgia, um, no money, really, you know, from from that and just always like kind of knowing how to work like my grandparents with their farm and you know all that like we just that was just normal to be sitting under a tree like shelling peas for other people to purchase and you know just um picking potatoes or planting you know taking your big toe and putting seed you know using your toe to dig a hole to put a seed in to plant potatoes and things like that I just grew up doing that like always dirty you know? <laughs> and then to marry into this family I've I've have learned a whole lot, but I've also have learned in maybe the past five or so years that I am good enough and that I, that my, that my, me trying to fit into some mold isn't going to help anyone. And we all need to be our true selves or else, you know, it's, it's just fakery. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It's, Nothing it's, ever changes. Like you just keep repeating um, and oh. families keep repeating the same curses or, gener you know, whether they call them generational curses or whatever. But yeah, um, my grandmother on um, my mom's side, my mom's mom told me when I was very little, she's the one that named me Angela. She said, heavenly messenger. And, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so she said um, that she just knew that I was going to be the one to break the curse. And I never knew what it meant, really. And I, uh, now over time, I've learned she was the oldest of 14 children in um very south georgia like amiga cairo near equipment that area yeah Egypt. So, <laughs> yeah yeah that's right near equipment where a cairo's or yeah i've said that if this is the real egypt then it's not cairo guys it's cairo, cairo. I probably it's say so. right. like syrup <laughs> yeah syrup well what did my grandma my grandmother who was a valedictorian of her college class would say pianer winder yeah. so over by the winder, winder. yeah yeah <laughs> And she's yeah. an old Victorian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So you're growing up like, I mean, that is down South Georgia too. I mean, you are, I remember being on the property. My grandmother, my great grandfather died. I have memories of being on his property equipment and just the gnats everywhere. And yeah. Just, yeah. You just got used to it. It was just yeah. normal for them to all be like all in your eyes. I still can see like little babies at the family reunion, just discovery <laughs> with gnats all in their eyes. And it was just nothing. You didn't even swat them away. They were just, yeah. Florida. It's so freaking hot and muggy. I mean, it is literally like being in a bowl of hot soup all the time. It's funny. My grandmother said that when she was alive, she said that's how she thought she found meditation was when she was a kid, there was just nothing to do, but just sit there and stare because yeah. it was too yeah, hot. That was me. I carved soap. Yeah. Now I'm like, it just, <laughs> it's just too hot. It's too damn hot to do anything else. Um, so you move, so you, you, what brought you to Athens from South Georgia? I, um, my parents moved up to Atlanta, Atlanta. That's what my Atlanta. family always said. That moved up to Atlanta. They're not even part of our family anymore. You're like, <laughs> for, for a job that my dad had at the time, whenever I was 12. And then they bought property right down the road from here in Bostwick and Morgan County near Madison. Mm -hmm. And so we moved there. I went to Morgan County High School in Madison, very historic town. Um, great cemeteries, great <laughs> old homes. And, um, so I graduated high school there and then I never went to college. I had a dream of being a journalist and that's really what I wanted to do. And honestly, like not to play the victim anymore. Cause I used to say this, this way, I would say, you know, my dad was just drunk and asleep my whole life. So he didn't even realize I graduated high school and never even talked to me about college. You know, like it was just not a thing. I went straight to work I worked at um, the Bank of Morgan County in Rutledge, and then I ended up getting a job at Athens First Bank here downtown, which, huge blessing. Mm -hmm. Like, I met so many people. I was the downtown girl. I was actually in a newspaper um, four years in a row, best bank teller in Athens. <laughs> that is so Southern. Like, <laughs> That that is so southern a newspaper. That that is I love it. I love, I love it. it. I'm like, Dad, where are these newspapers? I don't know where they are because I want to just frame that. Like, I know, right? Like that. I love it. I, that's in, in the New Earth. That's what we need to go back to the newspaper having those articles because yeah. I love it. That is, and that's community pride, right? That's like community, you know. And that is in Athens. Even though Athens is a pretty international town with the school, I think there is kind of still a little bit of a small town feeling from the families that have been there. For a very long time. Yes. Kind of they're all, there. Yeah, it's very, they're all very connected. And, you know, um, yeah, it is a very small town, actually, when school's not in. Mm -hmm. It's very small. Um, we can park anywhere downtown. And you always know when the students come back. Like, right. we, were, we happened to be driving through downtown the other day. We'd gone to the cemetery. <laughs> and then we were driving through downtown. I was like, what is going on? And we were like, oh, yeah, it's move-in day. Here come the students. So people, if people are not from the South, I've said this all the time, like we, we party in cemetery, like going to a cemetery is a huge part of Southern culture. Like that is an activity you do. And I don't think people believe me when I say that, but it's true. Like people go, you go to the cemetery, you go explore cemeteries. You I have a, a name of a person right here that I met that day at the cemetery and she was from like Carrollton, Georgia. She's actually from California, but now she lives in Carrollton. And she said, it just looked like a good day to go explore <laughs> cemetery in Athens. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, it's so, it's so, I mean, we're, we're weird. I mean, we are so, that's what I, again, that's what I love about the South is that here Angie and I are with two Southern women where we went to church on Sundays, but we'll go, we'll go light some candles in a cemetery. Oh Yeah. We'll go talk to some dead people in a cemetery. Like, we'll do that. And that's what I was telling you when Stephanie, off before we were filming, with Stephanie, I were in Salem. And the way they ran the cemeteries in Salem, like, you couldn't touch the graves. You couldn't. I'm like, this would really? not fly. In the, no, this would not fly in the South. Like, just the graveyards would happen in place in the South. And people would be, like, giving them the middle finger and going, sitting on top of the grave and lighting a freaking candle. You know, like, this is this is not, or putting pennies on top of the graves. They do all that yeah. kind of stuff yeah. for to appease the dead. And, and we were saying before, like how we, we take our ghosts very seriously here in the South. I grew up in a haunted house. I grew up in a haunted school. Um, it's just, it is what it is. And I, my, I remember one of my friends when, you know, when your friends first start having children and seeing them with their children, the people you grew up with, one of my friends, when she had her daughter, who was like two at the time, this was years ago, and she lived in a haunted house. And I remember her talking to her daughter and being like, now, if you see the ghost, just say hello. 
yeah hello no big deal just say hello hello. um you know it's just how it is down here it's it's like that uh, midnight in the garden of good and evil if you watch the movie they show the guy with the ghost dog walking and it's like yeah that's the sow that's normal what you guys don't do that in north you know walk a ghost dog like actually the (laughs) uncle in that movie or the man in that movie is the uncle of a girl that my husband i think dated in high school (laughs) oh really the one that killed the kid the main the the kevin spacey character Uh uh-huh because he was from yeah he was not from savannah he had moved to savannah because he was like an architect or something or a designer and he was going because savannah kind of went through like a revitalization period where they like revitalized a lot of the old home savannah's had its track i mean savannah is definitely the uh revenge body of all the uh southern cities because it's had its heyday of being very violent and very got really run down but then that time period came in where they bought it and re revamped it up and brought back those houses to life and, and that's yeah. what i think that's what he did right he brought up a bunch of those houses back to life and got caught up in some uh i'm glad you study so much and know so much you absorb it all and you should be you're like professor bryce like <laughs> i'm just a nerd i'm a nerd i'm literally i did a whole playlist on savannah when i first opened my channel and i was like it just it's just interesting to me it's like the story of and why people choose to stick around, like why entities choose not to like move yeah. forward to like, why do they choose to stick around? Do they know their debt? Like, you know, there's difference between like a residual haunting versus an intelligent haunting. And it's just like the concept of like what free will really looks like, even after we've left our physical bodies, like the fact that we have that choice, if we want to stick around, we can. Um, it's just fascinating to me. And I do know that people that do go into the light, they can also come back if they need to, to, to help their loved ones. Right. And it's just, it's fascinating to me. And it's not something they cover in vacation Bible school, even though everybody in that vacation Bible school has had a haunting at some point in their life. So <laughs> they don't talk about it at church. <laughs> so, And actually, you know, saying that I went to church every Sunday, I, I did pretty much with my grandparents, my country grandparents. My city grandma was very charismatic and, you know, she went to a different kind of church. They were loud in her church and ran up and down the house. So that was just, that was just, you know, a little too much, a little too much. So I did go to the Baptist church with my, um, my country grandparents. And I have memories of standing up on that pew when I was little, everybody, all the elders would come around and I would sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. This is now it makes me think of like Ring Around the Rosie. For the Bible tells me so. And I'm like, that is so creepy. Yeah, that is so creepy. If you have to have a book to tell you that you're loved by God. (laughs) Right? Right. That's what I keep. That, that's the big thing about the Sophia text that like touched yeah. me so much is the fact that the Sophia code, it was repeated over and over and over again, that you were born with the Holy Spirit inside of you. Yeah. That is not something you have to invite into you. It's already there. Um, it never left you. It never will leave you. And that was so impactful because then I started and I laugh about the Southern churches because, you know, like as we, as I, my family, as people say in my and when they get real hot, oh, I'm sweating like a whore in church. You know, I yeah. love saying that, you know, it's, it's funny, but, and there is a Southern culture to it as well, but that whole mind trickery that they do, whether intentionally or not really bothers me because human beings are so much more than that. And they don't, you know, you don't have to be, yeah, you don't need a book. God's not bound by a book. No. Especially one that's been edited a lot. <laughs> so no, I know. And I see, I didn't really even know this until I started watching you. So, yeah, and now I'm just like, I told you the other day, I was like, I kind of moved them all around and put them in a cabinet. It's like, I had them everywhere. Almost like if I had just had one in each room and that meant I was, I was safe. You know? Yeah, yeah, no. And growing up, I wasn't allowed to get dust on it or like if um, my Bible sat on my dresser, you know, and it had my name on it, mm-hmm. you know, given to me at birth probably. Yeah. And if I just set like a trinket or a rock or something down on, I was in trouble. Like if it had to stay like, without anything on top of it or, you know, and that's, so, you know, you say that my friend, Stephanie and I was going to do the Athens show. That's where we love watching this girl on YouTube called Rachel Photon. She is yeah. a Derek. I love her. Yeah. I, I just never her because of you. Yeah. She's amazing. And she has a backstory where she had kind of had like, I'm, Rachel, if you see this, I apologize if I'm, if I'm telling your story wrong, but when I remember she'd had maybe a near death experience or something where God had told her, like, you need to start to walk away from 
there's some inconsistencies in the Bible and I need you to help people understand the greater it's time. Basically it's time anyway. Um, forgot. Oh yeah. So the Bible, when I'll have to tell a funny story of someone I know that used to use Bible paper to, to roll joints. <laughs> and I think God has a sense of humor with that. I think God probably thinks that's really funny, but the Bible has been very much manipulated yeah. and people say, you know, oh, Rachel, this was where I went. Rachel was saying that, you know, they, the, they'll tell you, you shouldn't have any idols or no worship, no gods before me, but people in the Christian faith will worship the Bible sometimes over God. Yeah. And the Bible, and that's just a fact that the Bible has been changed. That's, that's not conjecture. That's not speculation. That's a literal fact that, that it has been changed. Um, and, and that's, and it's not, it, that's okay. But in some sense, because the whole relationship with God is with you anyway, you know, you see a two-year-old, you have children at two years old. They know who God is. Yeah, they do. They don't yeah. need a Bible like, to tell my them. My oldest daughter, we called it being saved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yes. So, um, let's see, she was about, she was like nine, I think nine. And, um, my husband and I were downstairs, we were having an argument and she could hear us arguing. And I went up to kind of let her know that everything was okay. You know, and when I went up, she was crying, but she was like, she goes, mom, God was just in the room with me. Yeah. Yeah. And so she's the one in Brooklyn. And so she said, God wasn't just in the room with me. So, of course, we had to have her baptized immediately, like, you know, because she'd gotten saved. But, you, know, <laughs> you know, we did. I mean, <laughs> get the luncheon, get the bat, the luncheon, the baptism. Sound yes. Image. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Which was nice. It was very sweet. They, we went to one of these kind of new churches at the time where they do the video thing and they did a whole like interview with her. And she said, um, it's all because of my mom. My mom Aww. talks to me all the time about God. So that, oh, that was a very sweet, you know, I just remember she was wearing these little pigtails. So cute. But um, so still, still just as, just, it's still the same. It is still real. Yeah. But I don't think she had to have, she had to be baptized. <laughs> no, I always see baptism as like ceremonial and yeah. like um, culturally anyway. Like, I don't think that dumping a person in water, putting water on a person's head is going to determine whether they're no. going to go to heaven or not. I think our, I think the God we worship is a little bit more <laughs> discerning than that. But um, Everything's your, your intu- intuition, intention, right? Yeah, so. Exactly. Exactly. Your heart's desire. And I often thought like, if I had a child, would I baptize them? And the answer is, even though I'm, I'm so against a lot of what the church does, I probably would just because yeah. of my family. You yeah. know, because it literally is just a cultural thing, even though I don't know if I would even raise my kid in the church, I probably would do it just, just for the family, just for cultural, just because that's, that's, you know, just something to have pictures of, you know, right. when he's in the, you know, and, and the, what we, we baptize in the, I grew up Presbyterian. So we baptize as babies. So you don't that's even right. have, and like christened babies. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, you don't even remember it. You have a baptismal gown. That's like passed down from generations. Yeah. It's like yeah. freaking disgusting by the time you put it on your kid, because it's been worn by so many different babies. I and mean, the Baptist like, church, at least where I came from, <laughs> you weren't baptized until you were you were for sure saved. Yeah. You've made that. You might have to do it again in case you you've slipped and you know, (laughs) you really weren't saved the first time. I've watched a stand up comedian once from Tennessee talk about how many times he was baptized one summer. (laughs) Like it was almost like that get out of jail free card. Like, oops, guess I got to go get baptized again. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm not making, but you know, if this is not like, picking on anyone's religion or anything. Cause I mean, my, my parents of course are still, you know, like it, it's everybody around me. is like this. Yeah. So it's, but it's just, once your eyes are open, it's humorous. It is. And God has, a, I always tell people, my teacher in India always says that uh, comedy is the highest sense of spirituality, the ability to laugh at the absurd and at yourself in the absurd. I mean, at here I am laughing at it. And I'm saying I'd do it to my kid too. Cause it's cultural, you know, but it's, it's, it's just being able to laugh at the absurdity of it all. Listen to this. Okay. Talk about laughing at yourself. So my daughters had the same boyfriend. They lived together in New York um, for, let's see, they're going on about seven years now. So oh, she's well, coming all now. She's coming. I well. love him so much. Like he is my son, you know, like yeah. I, I really love him so much. And, but the first time was well, not the first time, but the second time he came and stayed at our house. And of course in separate rooms and um, he was standing like, we were in a rental house. We were building this one and there was nothing in that room, but I was like, I am hanging across over the bed. 
Like I hung across. Can you imagine what he must have thought? Like this, I need to talk to him about it. It's funny now, but like I hung a little cross over the bed. It was a little twin bed with no, no headboard or anything. Nothing was in, really in the room, but I was like, I just don't know about this because I don't know if he is a Christian. I mean, this is, this was how I was, you know? Well, that's, that, 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 that my, I was the oldest. So my mother was, a, I was always, I think I got my dad's mom's personality. Cause I was always very laid back about a lot of things. Like just very, like, didn't care about certain, I mean, when I got my first tattoo, I think my mother about shatter pants because, and now I have cousins who have tattoos. So it's yeah. like, I, I th you're welcome guys. If you're watching, you're welcome. I'm the one that broke that barrier for you guys to go get tattoos. But yeah, my um, daughter, I think when I was talking to her the other day, we were FaceTiming. I think she got another one. I think I saw another one. She, you know, she got, um, I have a teacup thing and there's a story about that too. So I've got tea cups everywhere. I'm drinking out of one now. They're they're all over my house. People give them to me. They sign them. I sign them and send them to people. I'll send you one. But so she got, she just remembers like growing up and it would be me and my friends sitting around with our tea cups drinking Prosecco out of them. <laughs> and we'd always let her have a little tea cup too, like a little, a little bit of bubbly. And so she got when she, um, my, my best friend, an old, I've always been attracted to like older like drawn to older women and, you know, always had older women friends and Meg, she died in 2016. And so she was like really where all the teacup stuff really got big and, and Kat, my daughter would come and have happy hour with us. And we would just, she would share her wisdom, you know, with us. Her name was Margaret. Also, you know, I've got a Margaret thing going on. So um, that's, I'm going to do a whole playlist on the whole Margaret thing. So, but so yeah, my daughter has right here on her back. She has a, a teacup and it's she says what's your favorite cup mama and I sent her a picture of it and she had that cup tattooed on her back and it's got bubbles coming out of it Aww. anyway so that was the first one now she's got I think her Gemini sign on her finger and then I think I saw something else on her arm I didn't ask her about yet so <laughs> like, oh God, this is my first one I ever got it needs to be touched up it's the Aquarian sign uh, um, yeah. for me you could tell it's very old but yeah, I I, uh, I had a friend once that, and I have one here as well, but I had a friend once that got like a, a friend of a friend got a tattooed on her rib, her rib cage. And my friend was like, girl, if you get pregnant, that thing's going to turn into a bazooka. Like, you're just going to stretch out. Um, but no, it's so common now that, and I, I, you know, with the whole culture in the South, I, my mother was like that with my boyfriends for a long time, but I'm, you know, 39. I don't you know. The funny thing about me is I think people in the eyes of God, this idea of marriage is just like loyalty to the person that you're with and be you know i think you can be right. ma married in the eyes of god without being married by the state now with that being said there are benefits to being married by the state as far as like you know if your your husband cheats on you you can go and get it <laughs> <laughs> um but after seven years you're common law anyway so you know um because the south does take that i think I, and i don't know now but I mean, my parents are like hey hey i get hey <laughs> yeah, my, when my parents got divorced, I think my mom got more than half. So, <laughs> so I know the South does kind of take take the side of the woman a lot of times, but um, <laughs> but um, you know, it's um, it's well, that was when my parents got divorced. That was now divorce is so common, but that in the society I grew up in, that was not that was not normal. People just didn't get divorced no. in that society. You know, they just did not get divorced. And when my parents did, I'm glad they got divorced. But that was like a huge a huge wrench in um in Southern, in that Southern little town, like that, they, that this big prominent family that they're, um, were getting divorced. And, um, and I don't, I didn't know any of my, none of my friends' parents were divorced. I think some of my friends from high school, their parents are now divorced, but back then that no, wasn't I mean, like, it was the thing we would say, and their parents are divorced or yeah. like, you know, she's got a friend coming over and their parents are divorced or, you know, like, <laughs> So yeah. I would say this, like about my, my children's friends, you know, yes. all their parents are his parents are divorced. Yeah, that's so. Well, I always speaking of church. That's you just reminded me you did that. Like <laughs> you stand outside of like a Baptist church, a Methodist church, Presbyterian church. So not not many Catholic churches in the South, but it's all the Protestant churches. If you if you're at like noon on a Sunday when church is released, um, if you just go stand outside and listen to the church ladies speaking to talking to each other, you're going to get the best gossip because they'll be like, "Did you see what Susie was wearing? Yeah, I heard she was cheating on her husband. We should we should pray for them." If you just end it with, we should pray for them. It doesn't count as gossip. And so you will get all the town information just by standing in the front yard of a church on a Sunday. Yep, you do. 
you get all the town information. Um, it reminds me when I was a kid, I think I've told, there was this billboard in the nineties and my parents lived in Rome, Georgia, which is right outside of Atlanta. And so you're driving through like Cartersville and there was this big billboard and all it said was your wife knows <laughs> this was the best marketing campaign. Cause like for a month and I was probably like in middle school or high school. So I didn't quite know like what that meant, but I would hear my parents talking about it and hear my mom talking about it with their friends. So I knew it was scandalous. And they left that billboard up for like a month. Then the next month it said like your secretary knows. <laughs> and like for another month, so people was like, somebody's wife is rich wife is pissed because she found it. Her husband's cheating. Yeah. Like, and then the last billboard said that everybody shops Toyota in Rome. It was like the best oh. marketing campaign ever because it that is was, really good. It was good. I don't know if it would work to, in today's society, but back in the nineties, like that was one of the best marketing. Whoever came up with that strategy should have gotten like a total bonus because yeah, I remember it. And I was a kid at the time because it was such a big deal because of the scandal of, you know, a potential marriage breaking up yeah. because of an affair, you know, that was happening. And it's just, it's just funny. That's just that Southern yeah, there's so many. And we were talking about that before before we went live or not live, but on recording that. So 2008, when we had the first housing crisis, that's when your life kind of changed drastically, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah, we had um, I had drawn a, this house on a piece of paper and my husband was a builder at the time. He, was, he developed neighborhoods and, and things. And um, he had so many houses that weren't selling and had to give one after another back to the bank. And then the last one to go was the one we lived in. And, you know, I think it just sold for like almost a million just the other day. And I'm like, oh, or a year ago or so. I'm like, oh, I mean, we, we got, got punched. <laughs> got punched. <laughs> oh, no. On a side note, we did sneak back in it after we sold it. And um, I took a light switch cover that my daughter had painted. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> it said, you light up my life, mom. Mine. <laughs> Oh, I'm like, you didn't get, I cried and cried and cried because these people had bought this house and they had just taken all the things that meant something to me out of it. Like the, you know, the old uh, wood floors and the, the mantle that we built and the, you know, just things that I thought were just so important at the time. And I remember riding by that house and seeing a dumpster out on the street and all the plants that we had transferred from like other places, like rhododendrons from North Georgia and like, we're all just uprooted and just sticking out of that dumpster. <laughs> like I thought it was just the end of the world, you know? So we, we went from there and we moved into a rental house that we still had. Because in Athens, it's such a big rental thing with all the college students. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we moved in there with all the urine, the cat urine smell. I mean, that had been left from the tenants before. Like this is so, it was just very depressing. I think we even my husband, he was very depressed, you know, a man's ego when, when what he was doing isn't working anymore. I mean, there's no, there's really no income coming in from him. And yeah. I had um, started before we lost our house, I had started um, just posting on Facebook that I was making pickles and I'm pickling beans today. And I would really only make like maybe 12 jars of something per day. And then I would set them on the porch and people would come by and leave money in a cigar box. And then, uh -huh. um, and then it, the paper did a story and then it just grew and grew and grew. And then finally one day my husband comes home and I was, I was just like really stressed out that day. And I said, I can't do this by myself anymore. I'm going to need help. I said, Bell's food store has just now ordered like 40 something cases. He had no idea. Like he just had no idea. It was just, we were doing all this, me and the kids, you know, like I was still like making a steak for him <laughs> when he got home, but I was going up the road to the Wendy's, the chicken nuggets were 99 cents for four. I would go spend 99 cents. I'd get a head of broccoli and I would cut those nuggets up and make them look like there was more and feed all three kids. And then, um, you know, and then light a candle in the kitchen and have the house all clean. And he'd come home and there'd be like a feast, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> we really did this. I'm not trying to put him down. That's not what this is about, but it's just like, this is what, this is what us Southern women do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, I, it, I makes sense to me. It totally makes sense to me as a, I mean, 
my my mom's my grandfather was a surgeon and uh, my mom said by the time she was really little that my grandmother had trained her and her sisters when her, their dad got home they had to go up and say daddy what can i make you to drink and so by the time they were like eight years old they were making alcoholic drinks for their dad that's just what you do as a southerner so that makes sense to me yeah. so yeah so people who are watching who think that's is weird no this is just yeah southern culture that's just what it is so your husband had no idea you yeah, like at that time my car. dream was to be june cleaver like i really wanted to be that leave it to be for mom you know yeah. <laughs> and the universe was like mm, that's not what i had planned for you <laughs> yeah so for real i used to say that all the time i'm like i'm like june cleaver like, you know, just <laughs> i grew up on leave it to beaver um but oh gosh so yeah we that happened and then we we lose the house but the the whole thing with the the pickle thing it was just at the time i was just doing like pickled beans and green tomatoes and i was never going to pickle a cucumber because i was like no that's just normal <laughs> so, now i have to because they're you know it just kind of I had to it. It, you know, yeah. You create like this enterprise out of out of the ashes. You you were literally the phoenix rising out of the ashes. Yep. And I used my husband's name. So back whenever I was telling you how I joined Facebook and he didn't really want me to, I thought, well, if I, you know, if I make a if I make a company page for a company I really don't even have yet. I don't have a business license, but if I go ahead and make a company page, I'll use his name and I'll call the company because he goes by Finn, like short for Finnazy. P-H-I-N. So I said, I'll call it Fickles. So I'll use his name. And then the whole like motto was from my tour of that cemetery where the sexton said, if you went to a party, I don't know if this was before we started. Before, yeah. So, so uh, before we started, her husband's family was such a big deal that <laughs> get invited to their party back in the day was like an honor. Yeah. They said, you were going to a really fun party. They were rich liberals, <laughs> which is so <laughs> I'm like, we are not rich liberals. <laughs> but anyway, I just remembered that. So then I, then after I created the name Fickles and then I got a website, Fickles.com. And then, and then I thought motto, I was going to see if I have a bag sitting around here, but anyway, my whole, like my business cards say, here we go on the back. I don't know if you can see it. If it ain't fun, don't do it. <laughs> and so that was the whole thing. And that really, that came from that lady at the cemetery saying that I was like, I'll make it all about fun. And really like, if I have an issue with a store owner that I don't want to deal with anymore, that's all I ever say. If it ain't fun, don't do it. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Well, that's, so, that's, I mean, it, it reminds me of the story. What's the, um, the chicken, uh, chicken salad chick girl. Yeah. That, she's from, um, I think she yeah. might be from, well, she, Auburn is where they start. She started making wow. her chicken salad. Um, and she just did really good chicken salads and it just kind of grew and became this chain of these incredible, this is like, I mean, I, I'm a vegetarian, so I've never had it, but my mom oh. and sister, I mean, they are there all the time at chicken salad chick. And, um, and it's crazy how God, you just had an orb go by you, Angie, just so you know, Did I? Your orb just I wondered what that was. Yeah. You got a freaking orb. That <laughs> I saw really it. <laughs> yes. That's an orb. That's uh that's, that's one of your angels or your, I don't know one of your guys, one of your angels. So Margaret. <laughs> yes, there you go. Um, but that's, isn't it amazing how, and that's, and I talk about that on my, my, my channel a lot about friction. And, um, we talk about that, like in the yoga world, a lot about how friction is necessary for change. Cause if there's no friction, then you're not going to change. Yeah. You right? say it a lot. And I really like that. I've written it down somewhere even like, I'm just like, <laughs> it is. And it's, but it's, it's so easy to when you're not going through the friction to be like, oh yes, that was necessary. But when you're in the middle of the friction, it yeah, doesn't like, feel right. <laughs> doesn't feel good at all. And um, and so sometimes when we have these moments of what the tarot cards would call a tower moment, when everything collapses, it's because something is being rebuilt. And see, I've heard you say tower moment before, and I've never thought it. I, never, I didn't know that's what it meant. I thought it meant you were at the top of the tower. Like, no, it just comes crashing. That's the that's the tarot card. The tower moment is when something's going to be literally ripped from you. And sometimes those tower moments in life are not caused by anything you've done. Like with the housing crisis of 2008, we now know where that came from. Yes. That came from this group, this nefarious group. But what the devil will make for bad, God will always use for good. Yes. And, and I just had an orb go by me as I said that. I saw that. <laughs> um, it's a party. Yeah. It was like an orb party. Spirit gets sassy. Um, but, um, 
you know, so it, it's such a testament to the human, the human spirit in who we really are. And even in those moments, because we're all programmed to an extent, no matter where you grew up and what culture you, we, we laugh about the Southern culture, both Angie and I were raised hardcore in this hardcore Southern culture. I mean, I had a great grandmother, Angie, who was from Philadelphia. I know nothing about her because she was a Yankee. She was a Yankee. She was a Yankee. I know nothing. Like Stafford was her maiden name. That's all I know. So if there are any Staffords in Philadelphia, <laughs> I'm your cousin. We can't wait. <laughs> like I, I'm your cousin, for, you know, cause it, my grandfather was like, we don't talk about her. His mother, he was like, we don't choose Yankee. She was mean. She was Yankee. That's what he would say. <laughs> um, so anyway, actually that grandmother, my great grandmother, when my, my mother is named after her and my mother was the second born and my mother's name was Mary Jo for a week, for a week, I, for a week. And then my Yankee gr great grandmother came down to Charleston and pitched a fit that my mother wasn't named after her. So they had to go change the birth certificate and change my mom's <laughs> name to Alice. And my aunt that's younger than my mom, who since passed away, her name was Mary Jo. So, um, but my mom was like, you know, my, my granddad's parents at that point, my grandfather was in medical school. My grandparent, my, my granddad's parents uh, were paying their way. And so if my great grandmother wanted my mother's name changed, then they had to go change your name. It's all the money. <laughs> My dad had to go down and change that baby's name. So, um, very important. <laughs> very important. Well, my name, my uh, my mother wanted to name me Laura after the character in Doctor Zhivago. Oh, gosh. And my grandmother, my mom's mom, was like, "You are not naming her after a character from Doctor Zhivago. You're going to give her a family name. <laughs> You're going to name her Bryce." <laughs> so, so it's the same thing happened. <laughs> so my mother has been very good with my sister's kids. They have, my mom has backed off and allowed them to like, they, none of my sisters, my sister's kids, all of their first names are not family names, but their middle names are family names. Um, so they have, we, we've got some, some fresh blood and that's the thing about the South too. Maybe this is common in other, I mean, you, your husband's a junior, your son's a third. My father was a junior. If I had been a boy, I would have been the third. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you see that a lot in families in the South where names are like repeated over and over. You've got like four Williams in one generation. Well, there's even um, Billups, Finnessy, Spalding, Billups, Finnessy, Johnson. I mean, this name, so like the Spalding Hospital, all that. Yes. That's, that's Bill. That's from, it's from this family line. It's from, <laughs> um, and the Johnson, um, Billups, Finnessy, Johnson, they're down in Albany, Georgia, where I grew up, never, never knew them. Um, but, and then anyway, it's just, yeah, that name. It's it, big. It's, <laughs> that's, it's, it is. And yeah, I mean, this, in South Carolina, the Bryce's, the Williams Bryce Stadium at the University of South Carolina, that's my mom's family. Okay. That built. And I, I remember when I was in our high school, my college advisor was like, you know, you can just go, you can just go to South Carolina without even taking the SATs because of your name. <laughs> I was like, you really think that I want to go be a Gamecock? With the name Bryce on the state, like that's embarrassing. There's no way in hell I'm going to that university. Like, there's just no way. No, <laughs> not gonna happen. Like, that's so embarrassing. Um, but yeah, it is. It's it's a, it's it's the names are really important down here in the South, and that's um and that's a lot of weight to carry though. Like, back to I know and our son is the only, like he's the last. Like he's it. Like Tillman boy. That's it. Um, because everybody else had girls. <laughs> and, or they had, you know, they were girls marrying outside of the, the Tillman family. So yeah. he's the only, he's the last like Tillman. <laughs> with that's a lot of pressure. Yes. That's a lot. My dad was the last Watson. Um, he might, he, he had all sisters and then he gave birth to him. My mom had all girls. So I get that. That's a lot of pressure. I and don't put any pressure on any of my children. I'm like, Rosie, you don't want to go to college. What you want to do? She's like, I think I just want to maybe do makeup. I'm like, okay, you're good. <laughs> you know what? At this point, if I had a child in college age, I would probably try to sway them away. I mean, yeah. I mean, we all got to pay for the college I mean, with all the stuff going on with the passing of these bills. And it's just like all these, the tuition is so high. Um, what yeah, job is at KSU and he, you know, he needs it for what he's wanting to do. Like yeah. um, computers, I guess he needs it. <laughs> I mean, he's so, he already like at 13 built his own computer, built his sister's computer. Like he's so smart. He told me that he has a, 
I don't even know what Discord is, <laughs> but he's got a group on there that he either. A group on YouTube, but I don't know what Discord is. So he is like tutoring all of his classmates. Wow. Like, and That's even like the teacher, like the professors had to ask him, like, how did you do that? Like, or like, <laughs> like he's so, just, that's his gift. That's his God given uh, talent. No, but like doing makeup for a living. Like, um, I think about like cutting hair, like these are really smart kids at this point too, that are choosing to go that route because everybody needs a haircut. Yeah. Everybody needs help with makeup. Uh, everybody needs, um, plumbing done. Everybody needs their oil changed. And at this point with everything going on in the world, like to learn, actually, my dad did say that once that was some good advice he gave us, even though he was a veterinarian, he and we all went to college, but he was like, you know, find a trade as well. Like, even mm -hmm. though you have an education, find something you can actually do with your hands, because that can always be your backup, which is kind of what you're doing. Like you have this natural ability. You've created this business that's you obviously very successful because yes. you're not I'm taking it back though. It's, it's since the, since the pandemic, it has become like, I have no employees anymore. Zero. Yeah. So it's just me and my husband and, and today is golf day for him. And so he usually, I told him, I said, I don't know why I scheduled this for 11. Cause I know you're going to still be here and I don't want to talk with you in the room. You know, like what was he there? Is he listening? He, he said bye to me earlier, but, <laughs> uh, he's gone. but um, yeah, his friend came to get him. I think. Um, he will have beer today. So his friend, um, he has good for him. Well, you know what? I, a lot, there are a lot of truthers that are like, alcohol is bad. I'm like, listen, when you grow up in the South, I love the smell of alcohol on people. Cause I remember my, parent, my family coming home with like their cocktail clothes on and carrying us yeah. to bed and like smelling it on their clothes. Like, listen, God wants you to have fun. Life is hard. Yeah. Have a beer. Like just relax with your friends. I don't drink scotch fun. very often, but it, it seems like it's more like in the winter or near the holiday time, you know, and our kids are always like, is he drinking scotch? Because he always says yes to anything if he's drinking scotch. Like, like <laughs> yes, yes, sure. <laughs> like my dad's dad would have two scotches every single night of his life. Um, and that's just, every time I see that scotch, I think of my granddaddy, Ed, he would have his, his scotch every night. That was his, what like the difference because a beer does not do this to him, but scotch makes, and wine doesn't do this to him. But if he drinks scotch, he'll look at me and he's like, I love you. That's me on the rub. <laughs> I, I think it's just the way the compounds of the alcohol hit people's system differently. Um, beer I, on beer, I get goofy. I'm a fun time. I'm a fun time. But, uh, but Rom, I get very like lovey dovey. I'm not good with wine. Wine gives me headaches. I can't do wine. Tequila. I had a really bad experience with tequila one time. So every time I smell it, I'm like, Whoa, no, I, know. Um, yeah. I can do it every now and then, but no. Yeah. It's, um, but yeah, that's, and that's part of, again, that's part of the Southern culture. Like we, we're drinkers. I was telling my friend Stephanie, when she came down to visit, I was saying how there's a bar at my mom has a bar at her house. And I was like, that's common in the South. A lot of houses have bars in them. It's the first, first thing you see when you come in my back door from my garage. <laughs> so my sister has a bar in her house. I'm like, this is just a lot of houses in the South are built. My mom's parents had two bars in their house. They had a full bar and what, what we would call like the playroom. It was like the pool room. There's a full bar. And then they had a little bar in like the fancy den, not the living room, but like the fancy yeah. the living room was like real fancy. But then like the fancier, like the, when the guests came over that were proper that then they had this, I'm like, this is just part of the Southern culture. Like I said, my mother would have by eight years old was making my granddad mix drinks. Um, <laughs> When he would come home from work, my granddad, the one who had had scotch every night, my dad's dad, um, he picked me up from school once and took me to the country club for dinner. And granted, country, this was in the 90s, so it's not now, but this was in the 90s. And country clubs are owned technically by the members because they pay for it. Right. And uh, I was 14 at the time. And I remember sitting at the table with my grandfather. I don't know why it was just the two of us. I don't know why my sister wasn't there. Or my cousins weren't there. It was just the two of us. And the waiter comes by and my grand and we order and my grandfather ordered me a drink, an actual alcoholic beverage. And the waiter kind of looked at my granddad and looked at me and my granddad said, I'm her guardian. I'm going to teach her how to drink properly. Go get her a drink. Oh my and the waiter goes, yes, sir. And walked back and got me a drink. And I just sit there at 14 years old with my grandfather to learn how to drink a cocktail. <laughs> Nowadays, that probably wouldn't happen. They probably would have called the cops, but you know, the South was like, yes, sir. And the same age at 14, my granddad, same granddad picked me up from school and we were driving his big old Lincoln down the road to his house. And he pulled the car over to the side of the road. He told me to get out and he told me to get in the driver's seat. 
And he said, you're yeah. going to start learning how to drive. Yeah. I used to have to drive my dad around all the time. <laughs> now this is kind of backwards. So like, like I said, I came from a different, <laughs> a different spoon, <laughs> but my dad would um, get drunk and he would lay across the hood of the truck <laughs> you had to drive him home. Yeah. And he, and I was like, he, and he said he was looking for deer tracks. <laughs> we live like dirt roads and, you know, like I, I was like eight driving a stick, like trying. And my mom was always at ceramic class. Like she was painting ceramics that night. It was like every Thursday. <laughs> but that is, but that's so, I mean, that's why I guarantee you if a cop had pulled over, he'd probably just tell you to get on home. Yeah. I mean, if a cop had pulled me over with my granddad in the car, my granddad would have been like, you, sir, I'm going to go tell your grandmother or your mother, you know, they probably, my grandfather would probably, probably be cold, cold, scolding the cop. You know, that's just how it was back then. My dad, it, uh, I know in Quitman with my, would hit my grandmother's grandparents. He was driving the scout stick at like eight years old around the farm. You know, it just, that's just what no, he did. I mean, he needed to know how to do that. Those things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, cause he would go spend the summers with my, with my, with his grandparents, my great grandparents. And I remember, um, so this is another funny Southern story. So my, my grandmother's grandparents, uh, down in Quitman, Georgia, and Quitman's tiny as an Angie. It is like mm -hmm. a speck on the map. It's tiny. I only know one store there out on a whim. I know every store that carries my products. So like, <laughs> and it's in Quitman. <laughs> yeah. So, so needless to say, my grandfather's, the Bennett's, uh, they were very, a powerful family. They were very, a lot of more attorneys. Well, my a very wealthy family. And, uh, when my grandmother started dating my grandfather, now my, now my, the Bennett's were Democrats. That's the one part of my family. They were Democrats, but they were also Protestants. My grandmother was dating at the time before she met my granddad, a Democrat who was a Catholic. Ooh. And that was very hard for my great grandparents to swallow that pill that he was Catholic. Yeah. Well, when my grandfather came around and he went down to meet my grandparents, they were okay with the fact that he was a Republican as long as he wasn't a Catholic. So it's just funny how the old Southern like hangups. I mean, my, my sister's married to a Catholic at this point, but he, I mean, they're not, his mom's Italian. So it's more cultural. And, um, it's just crazy. Like how, how many issues there would have been back in, if that had been like 50 years before in the South where now it's not that big of a deal, you know, it's all these little cultural things are so funny, but it just makes us who we are. And it, and all these other things that were culturally acceptable when I was a kid, like driving my grandfather, or having an alcoholic beverage at the country club would not happen today. No. It would not happen today. They would have called the cops on my granddad you know, for, for doing oh, yeah. that, you know, um, so that's just, that's just the sudden, that's what makes, and that's why I, you know, people are always like, Oh, I loved yeah. Uh, what's the divine secrets of the IOS system. Oh, yeah. uh, like that's just the South. That's just how it yeah, is. That's normal. <laughs> that's normal. <laughs> that's just like, yeah, yeah. Like that's, that's, that's normal. Like they were laying out, taking their clothes off, uh, you know, driving yes. in the heat. I'm like, sounds good to me. That's, that's good. <laughs> Our parents would have been pissed, but like, it's, it's that hot where you're like, whatever. Um, so Angie, I, I know we're coming on over an hour. You're going to be <laughs> back for us to do a deep dive into Athens, Georgia. So for you guys who are liking these deep dives and I have got, as I've been talking to you, I'm thinking I need to come to Athens. We need to film together in Athens, something. And I want, I want us to do, if you, I'm putting you on the spot on a video, I want us to do a deep dive together into the werewolf of South Georgia. Love it. Let's do it. I want you to look into it too. So I know the story and, um, and then we can maybe bring even bring Stephanie back on and see what we can find even more about who this girl was and what she really is shaped. That's right. I do remember that it was a girl, like a girl. Yeah. I don't know why I think werewolf is a boy. I mean, it's, you know, but yeah. It's, I remember, I remember, I remember watching your video a while back. Well, and the thing is, when I, think I when probably I didn't it, believe it. <laughs> I think when I covered it, I probably thought she just had some like hairy disposition or something. And the people, you know, in the town. But now that I've like known Jesse's a voter and I'm getting, I'm like, yeah. what, was she a werewolf? Like, <laughs> yeah. what was happening? Was she? <laughs> was she? So, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to look into it and we'll also revisit okay. that story. Cause there's some other stories I do want to revisit that I covered a long time ago, because now I have a different perspective perspective. Right. On. Everything. I have a different perspective about everything. everything. Yeah, everything. <laughs> Nothing. Every time I talk to Jesse Zavoder, I'm always like, oh my God, Grimm's fairy tales is more of a reality than mm -hmm. but truth is stranger than fiction. 
It really is. It really is. It really is. And I'm still not, I mean, I still am under this assumption that this is Egypt where we live was the original Egypt. Yes. I would show you, but they're in another drawer. I, I've, my, my mother-in-law went to Egypt a while back and she brought back these um, papyrus little paintings, you know, and I've always, I haven't done anything with them yet, but I have such a like connection. Like, I'm like, there's some reason, why am I drawn to this? Like, why do I really like the, I just covered my dining room chairs not too long ago, with staple gun and this old fabric that she brought back from Egypt. I just felt like, yeah, like well, I'm supposed to. And blonde haired, blue eyed, white people were in Egypt as well. Yeah. We're, we see that in drawings. So it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have to be a, a black person to be Egyptian. You, you can also be a white person. Um, I always laugh, like in all the hieroglyphics, there's blue people. Why aren't we talking about the blue people? Like, is this, this not green weird? Tara. <laughs> like, is this not weird? Like, how come nobody mentions this? We just like go through school and they just kind of slide by the fact that there's a freaking blue person. Where are these blue people? Like, this is crazy. So, um, so yes, I, we have so much Angie. I'm so excited. Once again, guys, I'm going to go ahead and reshare her channel. So you guys go ahead and subscribe to Angie's channel. And will you send me your links to your, now, do you ship your pickles or do you ship any of your stuff to people outside of Georgia? I do a whole lot of people in Atlanta even order. So even though like Alon's bakery has it and, but a lot of people just, you know, aren't, have learned like not to get out anymore. <laughs> you know, they just like, we're ship every, we ship every day. So, so I'll put a link to your website okay. down in the description box too. Yeah. Um, because I mean, what a great gift to give people too. Like, you know, that like, if you go to someone's house or there's like a, you don't quite know what to get them, like getting them something like this would is so unique, you know? And, um, and especially since I, I mean, I'm of the, I really believe that right now, even though we all still have to like use the Amazons and use the big chains yeah. right now, I'm still any chance I have to like promote a small business because I believe going forward, we're going to be going back to us manufacturing our own stuff and, yeah. and, and there's more love put into it that way. And, and we're so actually trying to go back to that. There's stores. I mean, my, I look at my phone. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to tell them? Since we don't have any employees anymore, it's really hard for us to get distribution going and getting the deliveries made. And people are they're ordering and going, people are asking, people are asking. The shelf is empty. The shelf is empty. I'm like, well, they can order online because yeah. I, we can't keep up with the demand. And we've never been able to keep up with it. But right now, we really can't. Yeah. Not for the stores. We can keep up with the retail side of it online. The personal. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to put that link up, guys, because what a great, um, I mean, what a great gift. What a great thing to have in your own home. I mean, I know in the South, too, I, I, if someone comes over, you have to, you know, you, you put like a, a plate out of cheese and crackers. Like what, what, what is amazing to have something like that so you can put out for guests to come over. And, um, and so, guys, go and check out her. And I have to say, Angie, your channel is turning into my favorite channels because I love your personality. I think you're so, I think you're so hysterical and there's so much honesty. And that's what I love about this. I love, I love a good sense of humor anyway, because I, I mean, you see Stephanie and me together, we crack up at the most inappropriate things, but that's why, I mean, the, life is comical. Like this is the most uncom, being a human is hard. Humaning is really hard. And we, we all chose to come back into these really dense, heavy bodies and experience this dense, heavy life. And so if you can find people that make you laugh, then that yeah. you have found a true treasure. And so I'm going to really encourage you guys to go and check out Angie's channel and just watch her videos because she's funny. She's honest. She's obviously, if you watch her videos, she's going through this journey with all of us. Where we're all just trying to go like, wait a minute, shit's not adding up. Nothing is what we thought it was. And, but actually the truth, as you were saying, it just resonates. It feels better. Mm -hmm. The truth feels better. And we still got, I mean, I, I know we still have so much more left to learn, which I'm really excited about. Um, so, and, and, and I know that September is going to be rough guys. We're in the, the height of battle right now. So if you need that break and you, you need to laugh and smile, um, when things get tough, go check out Angie's channel. Um, cause she will make you smile. So, um, so yes. Well, thank you, Angie. I'm so happy you came on today. I'll, I'm going to text you and Stephanie and figure out a time to film the Athens episode um, and get you back on so we can pull some tarot cards and see what's going on in Athens, Georgia. Um, and, and so, and, uh, and Hey, I mean, we're going to be looking into the werewolf of Georgia. If you guys are from South Georgia and also want to pitch in with the werewolf of Georgia, just email me and we can do like a round table or something because that's a wild story.
that's a freaking wild story. So, um, so anyway, guys, we all love you very much. Make sure you've got hit that subscribe button for Angie and my channel if you're not subscribed. And we will talk to you guys soon. Bye, everybody.